welcome to Good Game Pocket Edition, your complete tiny package of gaming goodness. I'm Barjo. And I'm Hex. Well, we may have new consoles on the way this year, but the PC is still going strong. Indeed it is, Hex. And we played some interesting indie games this week, as well as the hardcore strategy of Airband Warland Game Battle. Warland. <laughs> Warland. Warland. Air. Airland. War Game. War, it's a Airland war game. Battle. And more on that later in the show, but first, let's do some dungeon crawling. While going to the toilet during a night of tabletop dungeons and dragons with friends, gamer geek Daniel passes out and wakes up in another world, a world where fantasy has become reality. This is Unepic, a 2D side-scrolling RPG platformer that's full of oddball humour, glittering loot and some very persistent monsters. It's all set in a huge medieval castle made up of hundreds of rooms filled with traps. Now this game reminded me a little bit of Terraria in its aesthetic and the way it controls, though Unepic has more of a narrative with Daniel trying to figure out a way to get back home. There's some funny banter between him and an evil spirit that gets stuck inside him at the beginning of the dungeon. He's always trying to trick you into dying because that's how he'll free himself. And you will die a lot. It is a brutal game, isn't it? There's heaps of traps and big boss fights. Figuring out the right strategy for those fights can be frustrating, but equally rewarding. And I do enjoy the degree of difficulty. Yeah, I found it a little grindy, the way enemies respawn whenever you teleport back to heal and save. It can be a bit demoralizing. But the leveling up of skills is fun and investing in proficiency with certain weapons. I do find that it's so important to pick your stats carefully in this game and you can come across gear later on that you absolutely can't use and that is a bit frustrating. So it's not quite balanced, but that's also part of its charm. Uh, I gave it 8 out of 10 rubber chickens. The multiplayer component was a bit of a letdown for me. It just didn't have that charm and, you know, the fun shenanigans of Terraria. But, you know, I, I love the single player, so I gave it seven. Now on to the very portal-inspired Mag Runner. Mag Runner Dark Pulse puts you in the space boots of Dax, a young genius who joins the Mag Runner training program. With your Magtech glove that can magnetize objects to attract and repel each other, you enter a training facility and set about manipulating objects to clear puzzle rooms in a very quantum conundrum meets portal kind of way. The puzzle rooms soon become a mixture of catapults and platforms and magnets. There is some great design here, Hex. I found the game got really interesting when the facility starts to fall apart and all of a sudden you're escaping the clutches of the very terrifying Cthulhu, the same apocalyptic monster from HP Lovecraft's fiction. It definitely takes a creepy turn, but the focus is still on those physics-based puzzles. I did get a bit annoyed when sometimes the puzzle piece you needed was hidden away somewhere. I found that a cheap way to drag it out. Yeah, that was a bit aggravating, but there's also a lot to love about Mag Runner. Newton the robot magnet dog was great, and there are some really good puzzles to get your head around too, so I gave it seven and a half. Seven souls who sealed the gate. I found the story a bit of a letdown in the end after such a promising start. What happened? to my parents. But the puzzling gameplay is solid, so I gave it 7 out of 10. Next up, the Monty Python of the game world, Game & Wario. Game & Wario continues in the vein of the WarioWare series, throwing together a highly wacky collection of bizarre mini-games that use the Wii U's tablet controller. It's a vibrant, colourful dog's breakfast of a game. Yes, a dog's breakfast of game design too. What a disappointment this was, Bajo. I mean, the old WarioWare games were clever, but this is just a mess. Basic tilt steering games, flicking with your finger on a tablet, dragging puzzle pieces around. I mean, overall, these were pretty lame. Yeah, it's a very lacklustre collection of mini games. I gave this four. Yes, I think Nintendo is still struggling to find a reason for us to need that Wii U controller tablet, so I gave it four as well. Now, off to the Ask Good Game Desk, Hex. Yes. Good game. Okay, well, this week we've got a question from MB, who is underground in Queensland. Hi, GG team. Sorry, Barge on Hex, but this is a question I'd like Goose to answer. My dad says he gets motion sick from watching first and third person video games and doesn't believe in playing them. Can this be helped or could you recommend games like platformers or side scrollers that are aimed at mature gamers, especially but not limited to an Xbox 360? I believe you can do it. Oh, well, that is actually a fairly common problem, MB, but I think we can rope Goose in to help out. Mm. Hey, Goose. Goose! Goose, come help with this question! Goose! Goose! Goose. Ah. <laughs> hey, guys. Hey. All right, well, Goose, I'm sure you heard the question. What could you recommend for someone who suffers from motion sickness when playing games? Well, guys, sadly, there's no real easy cure to fix from what I know. I have a friend who plays tons of modern first-person games and he's got no issues, but when he plays older ones like Doom and Quake, they just cripple him. I think it's the combination of the slippery movement and that head-bobbing effect that just doesn't sit quite right. Yeah, actually, I went and played Quake Live recently and after two hours, I felt quite sick. So do you think it actually comes down to a game-by-game -game basis? Well, in this case, I think it did. Mm. What do you 
think about games with a slightly lower pace, would that help out? Well, I think maybe something like Minecraft, for example, might be a good game to ease into and stay clear of something belly churning like Portal. Also, I think in general it helps to turn down your look sensitivity, but from what I've heard, the best cure just comes from suffering through it. How are you holding up? Because I'm a potato. I found that by making sure you have a reticule on, if the game supports it, you know, something to focus the point, that helps me, but still there are games that I can't play, like Xenoclash. Oh, that one was bad. Yeah. Thank you, Goose. You can go now if you want. Oh, thanks, guys. Bye, Goose. Bye. Thank you. I'll go back to whatever it was that you're doing. All right. Well, uh, as for more mature platformers and side scrollers, there's definitely a few great options on the 360. Games like Limbo, Braid, Super Meat Boy, Fez, Shadow Complex. Terraria, Mark of the Ninja, and Trials Evolution all immediately come to mind as great side-scrollers. That was a pretty good list, I think, there, Hex. So shall we get to you review? Uh, yes, we shall. Mm. <laughs> and this week, let's look at what everyone thought of the new company of heroes. I had a lot of time to think about those men. Seems like most of you liked it, and uh, Denied Operative here seems to agree with most of our criticisms, writing, Not much of a step up from Company of Heroes, but smart mission layout, excellent sound and great visuals are all there. Snow and ice effects may be a bit gimmicky, but it's a nice addition. Expansion in the ideas of the original, apart from innovation. A worthy sequel, if slightly underwhelming, seven and a half stars. Some of you seem to really like it, though, such as Far Cry fan, who wrote, I love it. Nine and a half stars. But I think Sunny Evil Bunny had the highest praise, saying, best game ever. I mean, hello, it's fabulous. Ten stars. <laughs> no surprise, though, that there was a hater amongst you, and that crown goes to Mad Kill 1993 who said it was poop. One star. A valid criticism. This is what you want to send? Yes, the people need to hear this. And Lion of Perth here seemed to sit somewhere in the middle, writing, if you're applauding Trails in Snow, Ground Control 1 did that way back in 2000. As far as I'm concerned, old hat. Yes, I mean tread trails, dust clouds from tanks, etc. One thing the game did get right was the old Stalin organ. That sound is very distinctive. Kudos if you know what I'm talking about. Six stars. The Stalin organ. Isn't that those squeezy keyboard things? Uh, no, those are accordions, Badge. Uh, the Stalin organ is this. And also, I wasn't really saying that snow trails were groundbreaking tech or anything. I just thought they were a nice little detail, so I relax. Th I think they were nice too, <laughs> But on that note, let's get back to the studio. Yeah. Well, it's already been a great year for real-time strategy games, but now we have a new contender, Wargame Airland Battle. This is a sequel to 2012's Wargame European Escalation, which we never played, to be honest. So we're coming at this as complete newbies to the series, with no notion of how it compares to the original. Bring it on. The single player is made up of four different campaigns two of which have you playing as NATO, and the other two as packed forces. Each campaign gives you an objective to capture certain areas within a time limit, and it's largely up to you to decide how to deploy and move your forces around the map. You also gain political points each turn, which you can spend to bring in reinforcements or order in various types of support. You could provide air cover to a region or even call in a nuclear strike, for example. And of course, if you and the enemy forces meet in the same region, then it's down to the battlefield. There's a fairly epic scale to the fights too, isn't there? I was overwhelmed with all of the detail. Each alliance is obviously made up of various nations, and each nation has their own military hardware and various strengths and weaknesses, all based on their real-world stats. And on top of that, every single unit actually has to worry about fuel and ammo. And when you look at each unit, there's about 50 different stats to each of them. And with over 350 units, that's a lot of depth. I always love a game that lets you zoom so far out from the battlefield that you can hear the sounds of a busy command centre issuing orders out on the ground, but then you can still zoom right down to see the grass waving in the fields. Go ahead, over. That said, I found it a bit strange how much they limit the scope of each encounter. You're given just 20 minutes to either destroy every enemy command vehicle or simply destroy enough units to reach a certain number of points. If you don't accomplish that, then it counts as a draw and the battle continues on the next day. But if you lose, then that's the battle lost for good. There's no retry. Yeah, and given the huge size of these maps and how slow units move, 20 minutes feels very restrictive. 
I'm always a bit of a slow thinker when it comes to strategy games. I like to fortify my position, build up a good army, and then wait until I can steamroll over everything before I charge out of the base. But you can't really do that here. You have to have a plan of attack and execute it perfectly. Yeah, it just felt so strange to me, though. I mean, often I'd be halfway through an attack and then suddenly I'd won just because I'd reached the point cap. And even with a victory, you often need to fight that battalion again the next day to wipe them out. I mean, what kind of war is that? Oh, well, we've got a thousand points today. I guess we'll just stop this battle we're winning and come back tomorrow and see how many points we can get then. Yes, when you put it like that, it does sound a bit silly, doesn't it? <laughs> what did you think of the multiplayer? Well, I know I always say this with strategy games, but this really took things to a new level. Wow, was I bad at this online. I think I actually managed to do just about everything wrong. I mean, within about two seconds of the game starting, one of my teammates said I should die of a horrible disease. And, you know, I didn't blame him. I was that bad. Yes, I was terrible <laughs> as well. And while this game may be rated PG, the chat menu certainly isn't. They are a serious bunch online. <laughs> But I think for those who dedicate the time to learn the units and strategies, there's a lot to like. Well, I was a little bit torn on this one because while on a personal level I didn't have that much fun with it, I do think it's a really solid strategy game. And for people who love comparing stats and strategies, they'll be absorbed for hours, I think. So I gave it 7 out of 10. Yeah, I agree with you completely. I gave it 7 out of 10 as well. Well, that wraps up Pocket for this week, but don't forget to tune in at 8.30pm on Tuesdays for 30 glorious minutes of good game. We're going to be returning to Telltale's Walking Dead universe for 400 days. Why the hell did you shoot that guy, man? Put the catch up to us! Hurry up, buddy! Yes, and it very much feels like they're setting up a new cast for perhaps Season 2. Mm, what happened to little Clementine? Mm, maybe we'll find out. Until then, Barjo out. Hex out.